We're working our way through Malachi. It's the last book in the Old Testament, four short chapters in five weeks. That's that's our plan. Um, last week, John Co. kicked off um, the, the series and took us all the way back to the start of Genesis. And it's because Malachi, even though it's a tiny book at the end of the Old Testament, it really kind of speaks all the way back to Genesis and all the way through to Revelation. So we kind of wanted to start and give the context um, one of the key themes of Malachi, I probably should have told people to put a, a slide up on this. Our, our, uh, our um, title for the series is Covenantal Faithfulness, and John really outlined that last week. So one of the key themes in Malachi is God's faithfulness, um, even in spite of the unfaithfulness of Israel. And we talk a lot about covenants for people that don't know what it is. It's an agreement or a contract. So when I married Beck on the 12th of December 2004, I entered into a covenant with Beck. Um, so that's what a covenant is. Um, all right, got to get into the setting of Malachi. It's a long time ago in a totally different culture. So what was going on? The Israelites had been conquered. They'd been sent to exile in Babylon for 70 years. Um, Some of the Israelites had come back to the promised land. They'd rebuilt the temple, the walls of Jerusalem. They'd been complete or, you know, getting there. Um, Temple worship had been reinstituted. So kind of the hopes of the people that had returned were pretty high. They'd returned to their land. They were expecting, they were looking forward to the blessings that God would give them as they returned to their land. And they're waiting for a Messiah to come. Um, And Malachi, the book of Malachi is written about 100 years after um, those people returned from exile. And, you know, things aren't really working out as they had hoped. Um, You read in um, Haggai that there's poverty, there's drought, um, times are tough. There's injustice, people are saying, where is God? Why Why are the evil prospering? And so their initial fervor turns to apathy, and their apathy turns to lethargy and even corruption in the priesthood. So that's that's where we're at in Malachi. And so as we're as we're kind of working through it, a key message for me is Israel, you have fallen short of our covenant. But I'm faithful and I will fulfill my promises and bless the world through you with the coming Messiah. It's a, it's a really awesome message. I've been really blessed by studying it. I hope um, I can do um, a good job of teaching it. And I always, last last time we um, taught, um, when we did this for us, it was on 2 Timothy. And I seem to um, get the week that was on. Um, you know, he's really exhorting us about how good teachers should be as, as faithful kind of stewards of the Bible. So, you know, um, have a good job. Um, so John, if you are here last week, John explained that Malachi has a particular style to it. It's a kind of a question and answer style, which is really interesting. The whole book is pretty much a conversation between God and people. And don't you love how um, God just wants to communicate with us and he answers our questions. It's incredible. Um, so there's a, there's a number of um, um, complaints or, or arguments. Um, John took us through the first one last week. Um, I have loved you, says God. And in Israel responds, how have you loved us? And God says, I chose you. You have seen the way I have blessed you and not blessed Edom. And you will see the way I am faithful to my promises. Um, In that passage, God says he hates Esau, and that's that's a um, you know particularly strong word these days. But what um, the the meaning of that word is 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 God is saying, "I chose you, Israel. I didn't choose you, Esau." And John used the great analogy of of it's kind of like choosing shoes. You choose a pair of shoes at the shoe shop. You don't choose the, the pair next to them. So he, that you love that pair and you hate that pair. That's the that's the, um, the meaning of the words there. So the Israelites at this time knew very well 
um, that through God's covenant with Abraham that we read about in Genesis 12, that God had chosen them as a nation for a purpose. I will make you a great nation, he says to Abraham. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and him who dishonours you I will curse. And here's the kicker. And in all and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So through that first complaint or discussion, the Lord's really reminding them here of his faithfulness to the covenant he made with Abraham in how he chose them, how he protected them and blessed them as descendants of Abraham through Jacob. So that's kind of where we got to last week. So before we jump into the passage, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is a light to our path. It is your truth. It is um, the story of our history, the story of our relationship, the story of how you created all things and you have a plan for all things. And um, it's awesome that you are a good God. You know, not only are you the creator, the sustainer of all life, but you are good and you want to bless us, Lord, and you have a plan for us. And I pray now as we um, we take the time to, to step through this passage in Malachi that you'll speak through me. We thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is here with us and we pray that it's doing a work in our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, all right, so today we're looking at God's second complaint. The people, and in particular the priests, were offering God defective offerings um, and were dishonouring him. So if you've, got a, um, if you've got a Bible in front of you, you can read the passage. Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. A son honours his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honour? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? by saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favour, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favour of the Lord, that he may be gracious to you, sorry, that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favour to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted, and its fruit, that is, its food, may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. And now, O priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honour to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. 
Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instructions from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts, and so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways but show partiality in your instruction. Wow, there's a lot in that for our 21st century ears. So what's going on here? So through the, um, the Mosaic Covenant, God in his grace instituted a system of sacrifices um, and offerings, um, offerings of thankfulness or, or forgiveness, and people would sacrifice an animal as a temporary covering of sin. Um, oh. <laughs> this is the problem of doing it on your computer. All right. Um, to explain this, we've got, we've got to go back to Leviticus 1. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of the meeting that he may be accepted before the Lord. So the Lord, the law required that for an offering to be accepted, it needed to be without blemish. Just so we're clear, God says it again in Leviticus 22, animals blind or disabled or mutilated or having a discharge or an itch or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord or give them to the Lord as a food. I love how he just goes through that full description of all the different weird and crazy things that were going on. So I'm guessing... They were all the things that the people were coming to the priest saying, is this one okay? Is this one okay? It's only a scab. It's only an itch. Again, in Deuteronomy 15, but if it has any blemish, if it is lame or blind or has any serious blemish, whatever, you shall not sacrifice it to the Lord. So the Lord is crystal clear here. You are to offer unblemished animals, but the people are doing the opposite. Bring animals that are sick, lame, blind, even animals from violence. I'm thinking here, you know, a sheep that's been taken by a fox out in the out in the um, paddock, or or a cock from a cockfight. Not that I know if they do cockfighting in the the Middle East back then, but you know, um, an animal that's that's come from violence is pretty fine. And the priests seem to be on board with this arrangement. So that's kind of what's happening in this passage. That's what. Um, God is talking to the people about. So let's let's back up now and go back to, sorry, let's go to the, the start, verse 6. A son honours his father, a servant his master. I'm a father, I'm a master, where is my honour? Where is my fear? But just like they did in the first complaint, the Israelites can't see it. How have we despised your name? They're bringing flawed offerings. They're not following the laws. They're disobeying him. They are dishonouring God as their father and their master. Two, two quick points here. Um, a sacrifice to be, for, for a sacrifice to be a sacrifice, it's got to cost us something. There's no sacrifice or cost in getting rid of something that was useless to you. And secondly, if we are to honour someone, our offering should be based on what they want or what they value. In um, Move on to verse 8. God shows the, just the ridiculousness of their behaviour. 
He says, present that to your governor. Will he accept you or favour you? He wouldn't give such an inferior gift to an important person, so why do you think that it's acceptable to give it to God? Um, when I first married Beck, I knew that she liked the... You know that there's two um, wedding anniversary um, kind of gift um, things, lists? There's a traditional one and there's a modern one. Anyway, Beck likes the traditional one. It's probably no surprise to many of you here. I also knew at the time that um, one of her love languages, I don't know if you guys have read the five love, love language books, one of her lang love languages at the time, I actually think it's changed since then. I didn't realise that love languages changed over time. But at the time, one of her love languages was gift giving. So at that time, I knew gift giving was important to Beck and I knew that she, um, she liked the idea of the traditional um, wedding anniversary list. And is there anyone here that knows the first wedding anniversary gift in, yeah, you know. Um, so I know what it is now because I didn't give Beck um, a gift of paper. It is the <laughs> easiest one to do. Beck did. Beck gave me this lovely letter. So, um, but even worse than that, I didn't give her a present at all on our first wedding anniversary. Uh, good start, yeah. Bring down expectations and then build on. <laughs> so you'll be pleased to know that things have improved since then. Um, actually, for our 10th, who knows what the 10th wedding anniversary is? No. Ten, who said 10? Well done. Yep. You get a lucky door prize on the way out. Um, so for our 10th wedding anniversary, we we're doing a renovation at the time, so we got each other a tin roof. So, yep. <laughs> Anyway, when, when I know that Beck loves gifts and there's an important event coming up and, she, and I know kind of the thing that she values, am I honouring her by not doing that, by neglecting that, by not giving her a gift? You know, is Beck sitting there at the end of the day on our wedding anniversary saying, I feel loved, I feel honoured? kind of what God is, is saying here to the people. So through this passage, there's, there's three ways where God makes it really clear that he's deserving of honour. Um, we see it three, eight times, sorry, eight times through that passage, God refers to himself as the Lord of hosts. Um. So what is the Lord of hosts? When he talks about hosts, he's referring to a great number of angels or armies or stars. What he's trying to, to get us to, to think or see is that he has ultimate authority in the universe. He can wield um, any type of army to fulfil his purposes. Secondly, he says... I don't need your money. I don't need your offerings. He says, Oh, that there were among you one who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. Um, the Israelites would have known this, this great passage from Psalm 50. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, I will testify against you. I am God, your God. Not for your sacrifices do I rebuke you. Your burnt offerings are continually before me. I will not accept a bull from your house or goats from your field. And this is it. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. Love that passage. He's got cattle that cover a thousand hills. He doesn't need our offering. He can shut the doors of the temple. And thirdly, the third way that he makes it clear that he's deserving of honour is that he says all people will worship him. In, in verse 11, For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. 
He's saying, Israel, whether you fulfill your calling or not, I will be honoured. How about us? Are we showing honour to God? I'm going to read a couple of passages that you might want to read along with me as well in your Bibles. Um, The first one is Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46, verse 8. Remember this, keep it in mind, take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. From the east, I summon a bird of prey from a far, from a far off land, a man to fulfil my purpose. What I have said, what I will bring, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. Listen to me, you stubborn-hearted, you who are now far from my righteousness. I am bringing my righteousness near. It is not far away, and my salvation will not be delayed. I will grant salvation to Zion, my splendour to Israel. Um, it's hard not to, to think of how deserving of our honour God is when we read passages like that. And, and another one for us in the, um, that live in the New Testament age, you, you can flick to Colossians 1. Verse 15, it's an incredible passage. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. For he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Isn't that just incredible? And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, and that in everything he might have supremacy. What does reading those passages do for your understanding of of who God is? It's a great reason um, to read your Bible to remind us of the nature of God, his holiness and his character. Um, It's really clear that because of his strength, his wisdom, his faithfulness, his absolute authority, we should revere him, we should honour him. But not only that, not only is he an all-powerful creator, but he's loving, he's good, he wants to bless us. Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise, Salah. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valleys of Bakar, they make it a place of springs. The rain, the early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Salah. Behold our shield, O God, look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour. No good thing does he withhold from us who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. What about reading that passage? Just makes you want to honour him. So back to verse 10. Oh, that there were among you one who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. That's pretty full on, isn't it? Saying, um, 
it's better to offer no sacrifices at all than blemish ones. And what, what's the, the priest's response to that statement? I don't even seem to recognise the, the magnitude or the seriousness of what's going on. <sighs> what a weariness this is. And you snort at it. It's incredible. I just, I find the honesty and the, the visceralness of this book amazing. The, the priest viewed God's gracious sacrificial system as an oppressive burden. And, you know, this was at a time where the, the community was in poverty and, and there was injustice in the land. So there's a certain sense that, um, of understanding that. But um, it's incredible that um, their response is, what a weariness this is, and snorting at God. So this, Malachi goes on, and he sharpens his complaint here in verse 12. You are cursed because you cheat me. You have a male in your flock. You vow to sacrifice it, but you actually sacrificed a blemished animal. So with God on our side, why do we feel the need to cheat? I shared this story at Bible study last week, so I apologise if you're hearing it for a second time. Um, when I was younger, I think I was about 24, I spent some time in Guatemala and um, working for a Christian organisation and uh, they they kind of designed and built infrastructure for Christian and charity organisations in, um, in Central America. I was a junior engineer at the time and just interning with them and um, the office manager was an awesome guy called Randy and for some reason I distinctly remember during our orientation there was, there was four interns and Randy was talk, was walking us through the office and um, everything was just so new and different coming from, you know, uh, uh, well I had been out of the country before but going to Central America was totally new for me. So walk, walking through the office and there were all these, um, these books and materials in a bookcase um, and um, they'd come from, from people across the world that had given um, their resources to, um, to the ministry. And, and, you know, most of the equipment, um, Randy and the team welcomed with open arms. Um, but this was back in the day when um, you bought computer software on a disc. Do you remember that? You'd go to the shop and you'd get a disc and you'd download it onto your computer. If you're unscrupulous, you could make several copies of that and, um, um, you know, you could use it several times without um, being detected. So for a charity organisation, it certainly would have made things a lot cheaper if you could get someone to come down from the States, bring a computer disc and put it through all the computers in the office. But Randy made it clear that the organisation wouldn't use pirate software because if God is in this, we can trust that God will also provide what we need, whether it's computer software, whether it's food, whether it's petrol for the car. He won't require us to skirt the law to do his will. We have opportunities to do that all the time in our work, in our finances, in our taxes, in our relationships. We're not sacrificing animals anymore, but the principles are the same. God wants us to be holy and live holy lives. So how do we honour God today? We're not offering unblemished bulls. What is our offering? Paul explains it in Romans 12, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing. This is your spiritual act of worship. And do not conform, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of good, sorry, what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Malachi wraps up. Chapter 1, by repeating the phrase, For I am a great king, 
says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. When God says, my name will be great, or my name will be feared, he's really talking about his reputation. Imagine you're a visitor from another land, um, and you're in Jerusalem. You've heard about this great God, and you've come to check him out for yourself. So you go to the temple um, to look at what their practices are, and you see the animals people are bringing as offerings. And the animals are blind, the animals are lame, the animals have scabs, and the priests are accepting them. And you think, these are not a sacrifice, they're just kind of clearing out the, the dregs of their flock. Surely that visitor goes away thinking, this is not a great God. This is a God who receives offerings like this. God's reputation is tarnished not because of who he is, not because of his character or his being, but because of people's actions. But his name will be great. Malachi comes back to this in chapter 2. And as God's people, are we pointing people towards God or causing them to stumble? And so as you close out chapter 1, the question on the mind of the Israelites is still there when they said, how have you loved us? They were questioning whether God was faithful. If God's faithful to his covenant to Abraham that he will bless all nations through Israel, how is God going to achieve this? Israel's failed. She's displeased God. She's giving impure offerings. How will the statement in chapter 11, in verse 11, ever be fulfilled? For from the rising of the sun to the setting, to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name. And a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord. Even the legends of old couldn't live up to this. King David, Abraham, Moses. But if you flick to Matthew chapter 3, Jesus' baptism, God says, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. God did provide a priest and a son who pleased him. Jesus is the lamb whose death is the pure offering for our sins once and for all. God has not given up on his plan. He is faithful. And because of that, we can trust his word and his promises. All right, that's chapter one. Done. Chapter two. Let's keep moving. So we've seen that Israel was failing to live out its calling as a son and as a servant. Now we're going to see um, that it's failing as a priest as well. So who are the priests? When the Jews received the law at Sinai, the Lord gave commands to set up a formal priesthood. The priests were responsible for instructing God's people about God's laws and administering things like offerings and sacrifices. They were, in effect, the mediators between people and God which sounds pretty strange to us on this side of the cross. But the priests were the, were the people that performed animal sacrifices on behalf of the people. Only priests could enter the holy place of the tabernacle or the temple. In chapter 2, verse 1, Malachi speaks to the priest directly, This command is for you. If you do not listen and take it to heart, I will curse you. And in verse 2, he says he has already cursed them. Why have they been cursed? They've been cursed because they've been unfaithful. We can see what that curse looks like from the book of Haggai, which was written around the same time as Malachi that speaks of the poverty and, and the, the drought and, and the things that were affecting the land at that time. 
So Israel has come under a divine curse and God wants them to know that they are under a curse. And this curse is in line with their covenant that he's faithful to uphold. They have not been faithful. They have not been obedient. And we can see from some of the people's later complaints to God that he's not, not, that he's not neglecting them, that he's not an unjust God. These are some of the things that we're going to hear about later in Malachi. God wants them to know that they have violated the covenant and what's happening to them is in line with their covenant. God says um, that he will bless, he will curse their blessings. What does that mean? So there are certain blessings under the covenant, blessings as a people, blessings of a land, and material blessings that they're provided to the priesthood under the law. Those blessings are now cursed because of the people's unfaithfulness. It goes on to say, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. That is um, particularly intense. Um, what does it mean to have dung smeared on your face and be taken away with it? So to Malachi's readers, their minds would have gone back to Exodus 29, where it says, burn the flesh of the bull and its hide and dung outside the camp. So what God is saying there is you, um, are, you have become a part of the uh, offensive part of the animal that is to be burnt outside the camp. We go on to verse 4 where it says, My covenant with Levi may stand. Levi was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. He was the an ancestor of the tribe of Levites. Um, they were a, a, the tribe that was set apart to be um, to serve God as priests. So the, the other 11 tribes received land. Um, the tribe of the Levites didn't receive land. They were given the position of priests. And we don't actually read anything about Levi as a priest in the Bible. But we know that he was an ancestor of Aaron, who was ordained as the first priest of Israel. Um, so Malachi seems to be using Levi symbolically to represent the institution of the priesthood in general. Then God goes on to describe what the priestly covenant was supposed to look like. It was one of life and peace and fear, fear in a godly way. Unlike the priests of the time, Levi was in awe of God's name. True instruction was on his lips. So Malachi here is describing the intent of the priestly role and contrasting it with how the priests were actually behaving. This is what a good leader is supposed to look like. Life, peace, truth. Sounds great. Verse 7. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Quite simply, our pastors and our leaders are called to know God's word, what it says, what it means, how it applies to daily life. People should seek instruction from um, pastors and leaders. But the priests clearly aren't doing this in Israel at that time. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. They're not guarding knowledge. So why should people seek instruction from them? And if they're seeking out the priests, why are they seeking out the priests? And why does God make them despised? because they show partiality in their instruction. We don't use the word partial these days. It's, we generally use the word impartial, but partiality means showing favouritism. Maybe they were showing favouritism to the wealthy, the powerful, trying to curry favour. Maybe it was that their focus wasn't on true instruction, that they were more interested in being influential in the social and political cir circles of the day. It's a, it's a challenge for teachers and pastors today too. The pull to soften the message or to preach to the people with money or power, 
Um, I'm actually going to read the, the passage I spoke about earlier. Uh, I'm from 2 Timothy, um, which I taught on last year. And it talks about some of the challenges of, of faithful teaching. This is from 2 Timothy um, chapter 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is, the, is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, repute, repu- <laughs> Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itchy ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires. There are pressures on our pastors and our teachers, and we need to pray for them. So, let's wrap things up. There are three points. I want you to remember, and Matt, I'm keen to get your thoughts on how I went with my pedagogy, is that right? (laughs) Pedagogy. Three things. God is faithful. Number two, we are to show honour to the king. And number three, we are a nation of priests. So firstly, remember God is faithful. So John um, made a comment in the chat, the teacher's chat recently, as along the lines of the book of Malachi was brutal to the ears of the Israelites, he wrote to, calling them out as kind of complete and utter failure as a son and a priest. But it's beautiful to us on the other side of the cross, being the beneficiaries of God's covenantal faithfulness to the nations. We still need to remember God's faithfulness. He says in 2 Timothy that he cannot break his promises, and his promises are awesome. His faithfulness does not rely on our faithfulness. He is true to his promises and his word. Of the Israelites, he says in Malachi 3, from the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. But of himself, he says, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed. He's saying, I am true to my covenant, that even in your continued unfaithfulness, I will not destroy you. This is what Paul says to Timothy in in 2 Timothy 2. The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. But if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God cannot deny himself because his being is faithful. So he cannot be unfaithful or faithless. From our perspective on the other side of the cross to the Israelites that were living in the time of Malachi, we too can trust his word and his promises. And his promises are great. He will not leave us or forsake us. He will give us everything we need for godliness. He will not tempt us beyond what we can handle. And he will come again. Secondly, we are to honour the great king. There were three things that we spoke about. God is the God of hosts, the creator of heaven and earth. He he has legions of armies at his disposal. He doesn't need anything from us. There is nothing that God gains from our riches or ability. And thirdly, eventually every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is deserving of our honour. And how do we show him honour? Through faithfulness and obedience. And I had to throw in this passage from Amos chapter 5. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will not regard I have I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. 
I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. God doesn't want empty festivals and gatherings and offerings and people filling the pews whose hearts aren't in it. He wants our hearts. He wants us to be little Christs, living lives of justice and righteousness. And finally, we are the new priesthood. On this side of the coming of the Messiah, there's now a new covenant. We are now all priests in the ministry of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we are still charged with presenting God's truth and setting a holy example to the nations. So in the Old Testament, um, the priesthood of Levi had a biological bloodline to Jesus. We have a spiritual bloodline, sorry, a biological bloodline to Levi. I really messed that up, didn't I? We have a spiritual bloodline to Jesus. We don't need an intermediary between us and God. On Good Friday, this is the reason that the temple tore, the, the veil tore in the temple. There's no longer any division between us and God. We have direct access to God through Jesus' death. 1 Peter 2, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. God's challenge to the Israelite priests is the same to us. Are we pointing people towards Christ or causing people to stumble? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your message in Malachi that you are a faithful God, that you are a loving God, that you are a gracious God, that you are a generous God, and that you are worthy of honour. Lord, in our lives, may we honour you. in our taxes, in our finances, in our relationship with colleagues, with our neighbours. You call us to faithfulness and obedience. And Lord, we should desire this with, um, with our hearts because you are an awesome God. You're the creator of the universe. You're the Lord of hosts who have legions of angels at your disposal. And even better, Lord, you are a good God. You're a loving God. You're a gracious God. Help us to give you honour, Lord. Help us to learn the, the lessons of Malachi in our lives this week. In Jesus' name, amen.